beautiful people. Thank you so much for joining Peeling Back the Layers of Your Life podcast. I'm your host, LaRonda C. Giddens. You all are in for a treat because this is episode 100 of my podcast, and I'm so excited to bring you this amazing episode. I wanted to do something special for you all, so I asked my friend Ashley Braxton to be the host of the show and ask me the questions. That way you all can learn a little bit more about me. So I want you all to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. But before we do that, I just wanted to take a moment to thank my amazing listeners from all over the world and thank my guests from all over the world. I mean, it's been an amazing ride since 2019. I also wanted you all to know that Ashley and I are in the lab right now and we're cooking up something really special for you guys. So stay tuned for that. But for right now, we're going to jump into this episode. Again, thank you so much for listening and thank you all of my amazing guests. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. So this one I did in 2017. So it's just kind of like a rolling vision board. Like it's a life Thing. It's not even just, you know, for any particular year. And the last one I did was in 2019. Oh, so this is the 2019 one. And that's me right here. I don't know if you can see it or not. Huh? You can see me on stage. Let's see right there. Wow. That's the audience. That's me on the, wow. on the camera, on the, on the big screen. And that, these are my life boards. This is just a life thing. So a lot of these things have already come true. A lot of these things have already happened. And I just kind of keep adding things in. Like the other day, a few days ago, up mm -hmm. top here, I wrote in my intention for 2022. And that was to secure more corporate speaking engagements. The other one is to build out a wellness brand. Wellness wow. Wow. And the third one, mm -hmm. what was the third one? Uh, hang on a second, let me see. Those are the retreats. So corporate gigs, retreats, and wellness brand. That's the intention for 2022. Wow. You know, it was a bit emotional, not emotional, but like looking at someone's dream board is super... Thank you for that opportunity because that is, that's a lot. Do you know what I mean? You're welcome. You know, when I was telling you on our call, when we were talking about um, the youth summits that I do every year, every time I go to the, we do the youth summits, I take my vision board because I'm always talking to the youth about, about visions. Mm -hmm. So I take my vision boards. I take my college degrees. I take my books. I take everything so they can see that it was once just a thought in my head. Right. And now right. it's something tangible. It's in my hand. Yeah. So, you know, just teaching people how to visualize what they want and to stay focused on what they want to do with their life and anything you want to do, you can make it happen. You just have to yeah. focus. You got to have a plan. First of all, if you have no plan, you have no vision, then you just kind of wake up and go to work every day or go to school every day, or just, you just wake up and you exist. Right. So, you know, having a vision board for me is just something is so important because it's something that I can see and something that holds me accountable and says, you said you were going to do this. You said you mm -hmm. wanted this. So what's, what's the status of that? I'm interested to hear your story about how you came into this because you weren't taught this. Were, were you taught this? Absolutely not. I learned this from watching right. Oprah. I mean, Oprah has been a phenomenal, um, I mean, inspiration, motivation, right. empowering right. people. I mean, you know the whole story. Right. So, I mean, for many years of my life, I watched Oprah. And even as a teenager, I would sit in my room for hours and listen to Deepak Chopra and Les Brown, just hearing something different. I never heard those words like in real life. Mm -hmm. So I would sit, you know, sit in my room listening to public TV. I mean, what teenager does that? I mean, who does that? Right. And that's kind of how it all started for me. And just kind of, I feel like I've been searching for something all of my life. Mm -hmm. And this, these, these dream boards, vision boards are a manifestation of those things. And just as I kind of walked along my path, I mm -hmm. kind of feel like I've been kind of following these little breadcrumbs along the way because you always get assigned to turn here, turn here, go here, go there. And, and that's what I've been doing. And when Oprah and Ayala Van Sant were talking about vision boards and life boards, I'm thinking, wow, what is that? 
so, you know, I started doing it. And when I was in grad school, I had a vision board and I put the letter A in the middle of that vision board and other things around that. But the primary goal was to graduate with an A, you know, from grad school. And that's exactly what happened. So I feel that, that you know, it's, it's a vibration. It's an energy thing. It's, you know, there's so many things involved in that. It's not just, you know, it's just not some exercise that you do when you just put it on your, your wall and say, okay, well, this is what it's going to be. You have to take inspired action. You can't just say that's what you want to do, but that's what you actually do. And I keep them on the back of my, my bedroom door. So when I wake up in the morning, that's the first thing I see. When I go to bed at night, that's the last thing I see. So this is literally in my psyche. It's in my subconscious. It's in my consciousness. It's in my DNA. And that's just, it, it has just become a way of life for me. This is so cool. And what was it like for you growing up? Because you said you started this, you know, as a teenager. And obviously this is not what society A is teaching you to do or how people think. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like an outsider? Did you not let people know you were thinking like that? How did you interact with your family? Oh, wow. that, that That's a whole, like, TV show. But <laughs> I'm, first of all, I'm an only child. So that in itself kind of sets you apart. I mean, I grew I mean, like I said, I'm an only child uh, on my mother's side, but my father's side, I have three sisters um, and a brother. But I didn't really meet them until later in life. I probably was in my early 20s when I met them. Um, and it was just a weird thing. So like I said, primarily grew up an only child. So I was very introverted. I was shy, socially awkward. And, you know, on my mom's side, there were, there were a lot of cousins. We were always going over to barbecues and different things like that and family gatherings. But at some point, I think probably around 12 years old, I just decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And I told my mom, I don't want to be around these people because I don't feel comfortable. You know, I was the only kid and in other families, you know, on my uncles and aunt's side, there were maybe six kids or seven kids or there were all these kids around and they always picked on me because I was the only child. And I just didn't want to deal with that. And my parents didn't push it. They said, if that's, that's how you feel, then wow, who that's okay. That? Um, so I just kind of was very introverted, very, uh, my mother was very um, overprotective. And so it kind of drew me in quite a bit and just kind of drawing me into myself and wanting to understand myself better and to know more about myself. So I fell into psychology. I love psychology. I you know, had an amazing 12th grade psychology teacher and it just kind of opened up a whole new world. I was always uh, curious about dreams because I always had these just vivid dreams about different things. And I just started reading books about dreams and that led to wanting to know more about psychology. So I spent a lot of time, you know, in my teen years and as I got older in the self-help section in Barnes and Nobles, that was one of my favorite places to go is to hang out in the bookstore and just look and see all the amazing books and authors that were talking about how to be a better person, how to be a better human being. So that's kind of how all that happened. And it just over the years, I've kind of taken a little bit from, you know, Dr. Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra and Les Brown and, and all these amazing people that Oprah introduced us to. And it's just, like I said, it's just become a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Wow. Who was your favorite? <sighs> I would have to say Dr. Wayne Dyer. Wow. And he, what was a, about he was amazing. He was just he is amazing. I mean, just the level of insight that people have is just, it's astonishing. Mm -hmm. And when you, and there's something within me that connects with all these people. And I always thought to myself, well, there's something different about me. I, I never knew what that different was or, or what that thing was. Um, but as I'm maturing, I'm starting to understand that there are a tribe of people out there that are just like me. I'm, I don't feel like an outsider or a loner, but the crazy part is, I feel like I have to go around the world to, to find the tribe. I'm like, where's my tribe? Where are my people? <laughs> Where are the people? It's so <laughs> true. Around the world. Yeah, literally. Oh. It's not in my backyard. It's not in my house. It's not in, you know, my immediate circle. And it's interesting because I may meet a person here and there along the journey, but they don't stay very long. You know, we, we have this exchange of, 
whatever it is that we're exchanging and then we move on to the next phase of oh, yeah. of our lives so it's not like that that particular person is there to stay they're there to teach a lesson i'm there to teach a lesson and then we move on but i'm like okay well where is the tribe that i'm going to connect to that we're actually going to stay and we're going to do some stuff together like where are those people and i'm finding like i said those people are not they're around the world they're a little bit of everywhere i'm interested to hear because i know it's a story what was your <laughs> first i know it is and i'm like what was your first in light can you remember your first enlightenment experience Ooh. Um, I can tell you a story when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with my dad's grandmother. I, I used to, we used to call her big mama. I just, I loved her so much because she loved me unconditionally. Aww. She loved me unconditionally. I think yeah. her and my dad were the only two people in my life that just literally loved me unconditionally. And I haven't felt that feeling since I was a little kid. Yeah. So it's funny, like back back in the day, I mean, like I was like, I don't even know how old I was. Probably was five, six years old. I may have even been younger than that. But there was this thing in our culture where the numbers man would come to my grandmother's house. It was kind of like it's like a um, an unofficial lotto, so to speak. So I don't know where these people did the lotto or or whatever, but the numbers man would come and he would write down the, the numbers. My grandmother would give him the numbers and give him money. And somewhere off in somewhere, they would play these numbers. And then he would come back the next day if she won, then he would give her the money or whatever the case may be. And all the time, it seems like they would ask me, they would say, baby, what's the, what's the, the numbers, what are the numbers going to be? And I would tell them what the number is, and the freaking number would, it would come out and they would no. give money. Yes. The number would wow. come out. Yes, they would. And this happens so often. And I, you know, I didn't really think anything of it. It's just right. maybe what's the number? Okay, well, this, this was the number I dreamed last night. So that was kind of a start to it. Um, that's an interesting question. I really have to think about when did I really feel or be conscious? I think I've always known it, mm -hmm. but to be consciously aware of it, I think it just kind of unfolded. I think all the pieces of the puzzle have just unfolded over a period of time. And I've kind of put those pieces of the puzzle together. So in hindsight, when I go back and I look at it, I can kind of say my first awakening probably happened, I, you know, it, it's hard to say because I remember, I was thinking about this the other day. I remember times when I was in high school where I would walk through my day and it just felt like I've been here before. You know, I've, I've walked the halls in this, I've been in this space before, I've talked to this person, I've had this conversation before, and it always kind of stopped me in my tracks, like, this is odd. Right. But then you just kind of go along, but then, like I said, as you mature, you go back and you start putting these pieces together, you're like, oh, wait a minute, what's really going on here? So, yeah, so I just think it's just been... And it, it just has been unfolding for wow. all of my life. And honestly, I think even back to me being in my mother's womb, and that's where the whole peeling back the layers of your life concept comes from, is I feel like in my mother's womb, God spoke to me and he told me exactly what he wanted me to do when I got here. Because, you know, I was asking, what is it that you want me to do? What is my assignment? And, you know, he told me that you are a teacher, you're a healer, you're a life changer. And I want you to use the power of your words to elevate the consciousness of humanity. Now, I didn't have that wow. realization until 2013. That's when I rediscovered what my purpose was. But it was given to me in my mother's womb. And I feel like that purpose is given. Each, everybody has a purpose. We came here to do something. Mm -hmm. Big, small, it, I mean, you can't really quantify what that is but we all have a reason for being here. And I feel like my life's quest has been to find out what that is. And, you know, in 2013, when I rediscovered that, I heard it very, very clearly. I've just been on this search to, okay, let's put the pieces of the puzzle together. Let's get this tribe together because this purpose is so huge. 
this is not something I can do by myself. You know, I can do my part in it. I can, you know, like I was telling you before, I can go around and do, you know, little five minute mini master classes or life classes and just give people information. I want to give the, the things that I've learned, yeah. right. the wisdom that I have, I can't keep that. I have to give that right. away. So right. it's just something that you do. And I had a really interesting conversation with a young woman in uh, Germany. She's originally, originally from South Africa. And what she said to me is, you know, my grandfather was a person who was, uh, you know, he, he grew all of his food, the, you know, everything we grew on the land. And she said, I really wish I would have paid more attention to that because that was such knowledge that he was showing me. He was showing me, but he didn't tell me how to do it. So she talked about generational knowledge transfer. So I feel that it's not about just the what, but the how. How do you get to the place of LaRonda? You're able to rediscover your purpose. So that generational knowledge transfer is so critical. We have to pass the knowledge on, not just the yeah. what, how do we do this? Right. Have you tried to pass it on to your family? And if so, how do they? Oh, mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> Girl, no. Absolutely not. The only yeah. person I really communicate with in my, because I have a big family. I don't, I don't talk to like my extended cousins or I just, we just don't have that relationship. I don't know them as adults. They don't know me as an adult. So I just, yeah, they, people just don't get it. My mom just, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like my mom, she knows that there's something special about me. She knows that. And I feel like she was the vessel that God used to bring me here because my mother was on, when I was being born, my mom had a cesarean and my mom nearly died having me. Wow. She was lying on that operating table and she said she saw herself floating out of her body. She saw that. And she said she saw one of her relatives on the, she saw this, this bright light and she saw her relatives on the other side beckoning to, for her to, to come, come, wow. come with us. And she could literally see herself lying on that, you know, on that operating table. And she was saying to them, if I leave, if I come with you, who's going to take care of my baby? So I know she knows. And I think in a sense, she's probably fearful of the knowledge that I do have. Mm -hmm. She's fearful of that. Bless I remember her. I remember her making a comment once, and we were talking about, you know, the things that I wanted to do on my vision board, and you know, wanting to, you know, fly around the world and inspire people, and help people. And we were we started talking about Martin Luther King, and she was like. You know, but they killed him. So I think she's fearful that, you know, I don't know. Oh. Yeah. So she knows. Yeah. She knows. Yeah. We don't talk about it, but she yeah, knows. Yeah, but she knows. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> she knows what she birthed. <laughs> because it was so funny. When I was a little kid, I was always the protector. I was always the one that's, you know, the protector of everybody. And she said, yeah. when I was little, I would always grab her hand and say, mommy, come with me. It's going to be okay. I got it. It's going to be okay. So I've always been that person to look after other people yeah. and to take care of people and want people to, you know, have a good life. So many people are so unhappy. So I was just about to say that it's, it's saddening sometimes how many people are so unhappy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hurtful. Yeah, it is. It is. So it's been a journey to try to help others get there. I mean, I love it, but sometimes it's, it's like, okay, I've got to, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you have to take a step back because yeah. this, this, I don't even call it work. I don't know what to call it. Mission. It's the purpose. It's what we came here to do. That's what we do. But I feel like you have to be able to step back from that in order to recharge. 
you recharge and then you go back in. You recharge and then you go back in. And I became aware that I was like the light socket for a lot of people. You know, people would come and plug in and literally suck the life out of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh and my gosh. They this suck the life out you? of you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So yeah, I know how to, you know, go ahead and get what you need, but I'm going to step away for a moment and get what I need. So my time alone, I cherish it. I absolutely mm -hmm. cherish it. People always say, well, what are your self-help or self-care rituals? Taking a nap, watching my favorite TV show. I don't necessarily have to be doing anything. I don't right. need a bubble bath or, you know, the yoga and the meditation. I mean, right. all those things are wonderful and I do those things, but there isn't anything in particular that I need to do. I can just lay in my bed and just, you know, no TV, no anything, and just think. Yeah. You know, that's just, just like think. my, my thing to do. Think. Yes. <laughs> I, that's my self-care is to think, think. You know, to maintain clarity in my life so I can do all these amazing things exactly. that I want to do in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so you're in college. How did you get to Germany? Well, the Germany part happened I, after I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. I went to, I like I told you, in 12th grade, psychology was like the best thing ever. That was my, you know, that was my, my high school sweetheart. And, you know, in high school, my mom was like, this psychology thing ain't going to work any because you're not going to make any money in this field. So I said, all right, well, I'll study business. She's like, you need to study business. That's, you know, that's something that's going to sustain you over your lifetime. So I said, all right, let me just enroll in community college because college just wasn't my thing. It, school mm -hmm. wasn't my thing. And just, I didn't feel like I fit in, but I had a lot of cool friends and amazing people and, you know, hung out with the popular kids and, you know, that sort of thing. But school just wasn't my thing because I felt like, I don't know if I, and there were certain subjects that I excelled in, like English and writing and, and that artsy kind of creative stuff. I love that kind of stuff, but the science and the math and all of that, it just was not my vibe at all. So I literally just, after high school, I enrolled in, in community college and was taking business courses, business law, accounting, all the things that just did not feel right to me. And after about a year, I would skip class. I would not go to class. I would just, I would do everything but go to class. But I went to my <laughs> psychology classes. I did that. I would go to my psych classes because my, my psych professor was amazing. And... After a year, I said, you know what, this, this, this ain't it. This is not the move. So I was, at the time, I was working in a bank, and I went to work one day, and I told my friend, I said, hey, let's go down to the recruiting office. I want to go to the military. Why don't you come with me? So we went on our lunch break and, and <laughs> talked to the recruiter. <laughs> what? <laughs> we went and talked to the recruiter, and of course, they make it sound so amazing, so wonderful, and they were like, oh, we can put you guys on the buddy system, and it will be so amazing. And I was like, cool, are you, you know, you want to do this? She's like, yeah, let's do it. So, you know, I took the test and we did all that stuff. And at the last minute, she decided she she couldn't do it. I said, all right, well, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going. Yeah. So went to the military. I was stationed in, um, and actually today is Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day, veterans, even though you guys won't hear this until probably 30 days from now. Um, so enlisted and was stationed in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and did my basic training there. Basic training was, to me, it was a breeze. Most people, you know, they thought, well, LaRonda, why are you doing the military? It's so regimented. I said, but you don't understand the household that I lived in. My mom was very strict. I said, the military was a breeze for me. So basic training was nothing. So we did basic training for eight weeks. And then we studied for the actual, um, I was an HR, I was an administrative specialist. So I was learning all the HR stuff for about another eight weeks, week to Fort Jackson. So when I signed up, they asked me where I wanted to go. Did I want to stay stateside or did I want to go to, I think, um, I don't know if it was Hawaii and go or go to Europe. I said, I want to go to Europe. I want to go to Germany. So that's how the whole Germany thing started. So a year later, I did like a late entry program. So a year later, I went, ended up going to Germany. And that was my first time on the plane, my first time ever seeing snow. First time being away from my family. So it was just like wow. a lot of first at 19 years old. Yeah. Uh, but the funny part is, this This is the funny part. The funny part is, even though I was in the military, I mean, I got to travel a lot on the weekends because everything, everything in Germany was so close. I mean, we could drive to Paris for the weekend or 
or to Italy or wherever we wanted to go. So we did a lot of traveling. But the funny part about it is, Ashley, if they said to us, we're going to war, we've got to go to war. Like, in my mind, I didn't think that would ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that's what I was really there for. It's the craziest, <laughs> stupidest thing. But, I mean, we were having so much fun there. I mean, don't get it twisted. We were, because we were on a nuclear weapon site when I was in Germany. And for about a good six months, I couldn't tell my family where, where I was located. I couldn't tell them the specifics of where I was located. The only thing they knew that I was in this little town in Germany. Here's a P.O. box. This is where I am. So, you know, I had a uh, secret security clearance and we handled um, nuclear weapons. So we were trained with the nuclear weapons. In the middle of the night, they would, they would ring the alarm and we'd have to get up. And Because, I mean, if you're in wartime, if you're in the middle of the night, you're sleeping, yeah. and something happens, you've got to be able to respond. So in the middle of the night, they would ring that alarm and we would jump out of bed and, you know, put our, our, our gear on and we'd have to run up this hill and secure those weapons. So we were loading weapons onto the, you know, the trucks and actually simulating if we were having to go to war. So we'd run out of the gates and, you know, that's just what we do. We would go out in the fields for, you know, several weeks at a time and, you know, do that training. And that's just what we did. And, you know, even though I was doing all of that stuff in real life, in my head, I have to laugh at myself now because I'm thinking, my God, if I really had to go to war, what, the, what, yeah. yeah, what the what? <laughs> <laughs> you were wee, you were going all over I, the place. Listen, I was, I, I probably traveled about eight or nine different countries out, and I was all over the place. <laughs> at one point, when I got back home, because I was, I did like um, the reserve, so I was in the active duty for three years. And I was in the reserve for another five years. And in the reserves, they can still call you back at any given moment. And my dad was like, if they call her back, then I'll just have to dress up in a dress and pretend that I'm her because there's no way my daughter's going. <laughs> She's not going to war. Absolutely not. Because he was in the military too and he was stationed yeah. in Germany. So he was oh, like, no, nah, wow. we're not doing that. <laughs> do you speak German? I do not. But I did take a German Head Start class, but that means nothing. Yeah. I mean, we, we did enough to be able to get around the town when we were out and out. Okay. Uh, but, and did know. you enjoy being, did you enjoy it? I absolutely loved it. Oh, it was one of the best nice. times of my life. Yeah. Oh, nice. I loved it. I had a lot of amazing people around me, a lot of good friends. And I mean, I don't really keep in, there's a couple people that I've kept in touch with over the years or have found on Facebook, or they found me on Facebook. Um, but yeah, it was it was an amazing time of my life. I mean, it was, it was transformational. It really was. Wow. You still yeah. keep in contact with the girls? Every they, now and then. Every now and then, yeah. yeah. I'll see them on Facebook, because I'm hardly ever on Facebook anymore. So, uh, But they're there. I know how to get in touch with them. We're all Facebook friends. So, Would you yeah. ever move back to Germany? No, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about staying there and going to school. I wanted to go to Heidelberg University, but it just, I don't know. I was just ready to come home. You know, I yeah. was ready to come home and, and start my life, start that next chapter of my life. And yeah, it was, it was great, but I want to go back there for sure because there's other places in Germany that I have been that I'd like to go, uh, go to and just visit and just, you know, have that, those moments of nostalgia and all that good stuff. But it was a blast. It was an absolute blast. Yeah. That's so cool. So you closed that happy chapter. You loved it. You <laughs> you were going everywhere, not expecting war. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that's pretty funny, right? Yeah. Not expecting the war. I wasn't. I, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. That's so good, though, that you weren't expecting it. I feel like that probably made your experience even different because you were just having fun. I was just having fun. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. <laughs> and what was the yeah. next chapter for you? Well, the next chapter was corporate life. So, you know, when I got home, literally, I probably took maybe six months off and hit the ground running. I was ready to, you know get started. And I did, you know, worked in corporate in the financial services sector for about 13 years. And that was an amazing experience too. Met some really great people and had a really lot of great experiences. And 
you know, learned a lot about business and how to be a professional and, and different things like that. Because I think that's one thing that college doesn't teach you. No. It doesn't teach you how to be a professional. It doesn't teach you how to interact with people and to negotiate and to, you know, practice building relationships and, and different things like that. So that's one of the things that being in the corporate environment taught me and, you know, being around the executives and that type of thing is just, yeah, it was, it was really, really another great experience. And those are all of those skill sets. It's interesting. And I always say this, everything you've ever done before is connects to everything that you'll ever do. So all of those skill sets, you kind of take those with you along the way. Even if you transition from the military and you go into corporate and now that I'm in state government, all those things I take with me, I'm able to use those skills. So yeah, that was cool. I love too. how when you said you said you like you don't learn those things in college, and I'm shaking my head no, as you if don't. I had actually <laughs> went to college more than one year. But you went. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't finish. I was just like you, like oh my gosh, I feel like we could just learn this on our own. Yeah, it it was really difficult for me to stay focus and to show up and to not feel like it was a waste of time and, and that yeah. was just my experience and how yeah. I was life yeah oh I, I couldn't but you know what Ashley this is gonna make you giggle it took me 25 years to get my bachelor's degree 25 years so that first year that first year in community college yeah yeah. I was able to, and the funny thing is, when I moved to Atlanta, I met someone and she told me, she's like, you know, you can get your degree, but you don't have to actually go to the school. She said, you can go to, she's like, I go to University of Alabama, I take courses there and I'm working on my bachelor's degree. I'm like, oh, really? I said, well, tell me some information about that. I want to know, I want to know about that. So she gave me all the information, went to the school, got, did my orientation, enrolled and racked up a number of credits and the credits that I had when I was at the community college, I was able to use those credits too. So it wasn't like a traditional class. I was mm -hmm. creating my own class based on my life experiences, wow. which was amazing. And I took like a lot of my core classes at LSU. So some of the, the college courses that I like my mass and um, criminology and different courses like that, child development, I was able to, you know, tandemly do Louisiana State University and University of Alabama at the same time and just kind of rack up those credits. So since University of Alabama wasn't like a traditional class, I'm thinking, man, this is amazing. So I was able to get that degree, even though it took me 25 years because I was, I finally started studying something that I love, psychology. Yeah. I, you know, it's like, it's full circle now. I'm right. studying something that I really right. love. So right. I can excel in that now. So when I started yeah. on my master's degree, I mean, that was a breeze because I had already been working in the field so a lot of things that I was learning, I mean, it was, it was a cakewalk, you know? So yeah, that's kind of, and I just knocked that out in two years. I'm like, I'm just, cause I saw, I saw people around me that had their master's degree mm -hmm. and the field that I was working in, it didn't require it. And a lot, even like when I was in corporate, I didn't have, I had a high school diploma, but I was able to, you know, move up the corporate ladder and, you know, be in management positions and it didn't affect me in any way. So but the, the crazy part is when I moved to Atlanta, I was thinking, man, I, I, I feel like I need to get this degree because I felt like all the people here were so educated. I was like, man, there was, you know, there was a little fear there. I'm thinking, man, I, I can't go to Atlanta. All those educated black folks in Atlanta, I, I wouldn't fit in, but I did. Yeah. And then, you know, as I, you know, kind of moved around a bit in, in state government, I saw people that had their master's degrees and where they were going. So I said, well, hey, let me enroll in this, you know, this school and get my master's too. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. I'm so proud of you for just Thank taking you. and accepting that journey and just doing what felt right. And yeah, look at that. Now it became easy. Yeah. You know, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Why do we brush us? I don't know. But I, I will definitely be getting it. Definitely being like you studying psychology. I know it'll come later, but right now like, I want to go to culinary just, school. I want to do chill. That. Yeah. yeah. You got to do what you feel. That's the thing. You have to do the things that feel good to you. Mm -hmm. You know, if it feels good to you to go to culinary school, you love to cook. Absolutely. Exactly. And who knows that may be a, a, a chapter in my life because I love to cook. I love food. I'm a foodie. 
So you never know. I might be in class with you or, you know what I mean? You never know. Just One of these retreats has to be a European tour and we have listen, to go. Listen, listen. We just have to eat. Yeah, <laughs> we just, we're just going to go. <laughs> we're just going to go eat. We need to live our best lives in our hotel on Absolutely. your private jet. You on the private board. jet. I have it's some funny. things. But check this out about the private jets. It's not even going to be my private jet. I'm not going to spend a dime for this jet. Someone is going to like what I'm doing so much. They're going to come to me and say, LaRonda, I have a fleet of jets. You have access to these jets whenever you want them, whenever you need them to go wherever you want in the world. I've already visualized it. I've already seen it. And if, I'm going to tell you where the whole private jet thing came in. I used to love watching Criminal Minds all the time. I used to sit and watch it for hours, just binge on it. I always thought it was so cool how they would just kind of go off on these ventures solving right. crimes. But you guys aren't on a private jet. Like, what? I said, wait a minute. I want a team that I can fly around the world on a private jet with. This is too cool. So that in 2013, I put that on my vision board. I said, this is, I, this is what I need. Yeah. My people, we need a private jet. We're not flying on, on no, <laughs> no regular flights. We, we got a whole jet situation going on. So yeah, that's where the whole private jet thing came came from. And that's all I talk about. Yeah. My, if you look at my phone, you probably can't see it, but there's a picture of a private jet. When no. I touch the phone, that's what I see, Is a it? private jet. Yeah, absolutely. Ah! Absolutely. How do you yeah. help people understand that it's about the feeling? That's a hard one. Mm. Because first you have to get people to even decide what they want for their life. So they can't really feel anything if they don't know what they want. That's the first thing. So it's, it's that whole self-awareness. You've got to have the self-awareness first. You've got to know what you want first. Then you can kind of guide people to tapping into how things make you feel. If you're in a room, how does that room make you feel when you're around this particular person? How does that make you feel? So just kind of asking those type of questions and getting people to become aware of how they're feeling in certain situations. It's just talking them through it, just having conversations about how do you feel about things? Because a lot of times people don't even think about how they feel or how things make them feel or how situations make them feel. Feeling for me, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's intuition, it's, it's just, it's energy, it's a vibration. Like in any time when I do have a speaking engagement, I make sure I'm the first person in the room, I'll get there maybe 30 minutes before, and I'll walk the four corners of that room to inject my own energy. So whoever's energy was in there before, we gotta get that out of there. I want my energy in the room. So when people walk in the room, it's just like, ooh, it feels good in here. They don't know it feels good, but it feels good. You know, when you walk into a space, it feels good. When I first walked into my home in Atlanta and and I, cause I was looking at a lot of different homes. And when I first walked into this house, I said, Ooh, this house feels good. And I had, I had been into, you know, I don't know, 10 or 15 different homes that the realtor had taken me to. But when I walked into this house, first of all, they were playing, they had jazz music kind of piped throughout the house. And I love jazz music. So when I walked in, I was like, oh man, this is nice. This feels good. <laughs> but just as I'm walking through, there was just a vibe. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a vibe. vibe. And the crazy part about it is actually these people, I live in a city in Florida called Coral Springs, Florida, because I'm originally from Florida, born and raised there. And I was living in the city called Coral Springs, Florida. We were there for about 25 years in the suburbs. And the, the previous owners of this home, they were the, the first owners, the previous owners of this home lived in Coral Springs, Florida too. Wow. Exactly. What are the chances of that happening? Wow. The yeah. chances of you setting up your life to get what you want and now you get what you want and that. Uh, this is it. People don't understand. It's just, there's nothing magical about this. There's nothing right. woo-woo about it. It just is what it is. If you tap into it, if you tune into how things make you feel, because all the other homes that I walked into, they were just kind of, they were nice, but when you walk in that space, it's like, ooh, it feels good. And I'm all about comfort. I like to feel comfortable. I, I had, it's so funny, one of my work colleagues, she called me out one day because we were always on the road. We were always doing, you know, setting different booths up for at trade shows or things like that or having different events. And 
anytime we would go anywhere, I always had to have my jacket. I had to have my cooler and inside my cooler, I probably had some fruit or some snacks and I had water and I always made sure I'm comfortable. And she's like, Lorana, you are, every time we go somewhere, we are getting ready to go somewhere, you've got that cooler and you've got that, that jacket. You're such a creature. You know, you need that, that comfort. I said, you're absolutely right. I never noticed that before. Yeah. So when she when she said that it's it's so funny you never notice that people are watching the things that you do and they notice all these little idiosyncrasies about you and when she called me out on that I'm thinking hmm she's right about that I you know I love being comfortable I love when I'm at home I'm in nice comfortable sweats you know mm -hmm. socks and just I want to be comfortable I have this blanket on my bed right now that I've had a, well someone gave it to me when I was in Germany and that blanket's 30 years old it's a thermal blanket and every winter every fall I'm like waiting to pull this blanket out because it just feels good it's comfortable good. so yeah so for people to be able to tap into how things make them feel mm -hmm. is a very good guidepost to that next thing because we're always looking for that next right thing Oprah always talk about the, the next right thing or the next right move for your life you can it's a feeling you can feel it right you can literally feel it when it was time for me to leave Florida. And it was just, when I left Florida, it was so unexpected. My friends were like, you're going to do what? You're moving to Atlanta. You don't know anybody there. You've never, and my friend was like, you've never done it. <laughs> what? I didn't know a soul. Yeah. But what I did do, I, I came here the year prior on business. I, you know, met with some clients in, in Dunwoody, Georgia. And if it was that feeling, it felt done what he felt good to me. It reminded me of home in the suburbs. It felt good. And we were sitting in the restaurant. I can't remember. It was, um, I think it was Houston Steak Restaurant or something. And we took the clients there and it just felt good. I was like, man, ooh, Atlanta. You're feeling real, <laughs> you're feeling real good right now. <laughs> so I went home and I said, man, I, I want to move to Atlanta. And back then you could, you know, go to the, go to the bookstore and grab a paper and, you know, look up the classified ads and, you know, find a job. And that's exactly what I did. That Sunday, <laughs> I opened the newspaper and I found a job that I was doing in Florida. So what I do, I got my resume together that Monday morning, faxed it off. By noon, they were calling me. Well, I was going to say Friday. They, you said nude. <laughs> No, no, wow. no, ma'am. Monday morning, fax the <laughs> resume. By noon, they were calling me. <laughs> they sent me a ticket. They sent, they said, I mean, everything, hotel room, air, yeah, like. Set up. They Hand given, I, hand delivered to you. In and and the funny part is the on. very first apartment that I lived here, lived in Atlanta because I started studying the maps. I'm like, okay, I'm going to live in Atlanta. I need to study the maps. I was studying the maps and oddly enough, I mean, it's no, no, I don't believe like anything in life is a coincidence. And people were telling me about the Atlanta traffic and they're like, you're going to be sitting in traffic every day going to work. And I didn't know that the place that I would be working was literally five minutes down the street from where I work. So I drove out of my apartment complex, made a left, drove five minutes and I was at work. And boom, yeah, no work. traffic. No traffic. You know, story of our lives. Yep. People are always like, I, what? And when yes. I walked into the apartment complex, because I think I looked at two or three different places, I was like, oh, this feels good. It's this nice. is nice. Guys, I'm going. What? Yeah, yeah I got to go. Yep. See ya. Love you. I got to go. <laughs> 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 I have a really good question that I've been questioning myself and I would love your answer to this. Sure. How can we, or is it not our job, but, but if we could, how could we help parents understand and really come into alignment with that your child is not your object? You know, really fostering the idea of that this is, this is a person, you know, and you have to learn that person and you have, I'm only asking this because I feel like it starts with the parents. Absolutely. Everything starts with the parents. Everything starts with the parents, Everything. but not in that way, in the way of it starts with the parents of how can we help the world now become more enlightened about that? 
Ooh, if the parent is not enlightened, yeah, then it's a challenge because parents are when a child is born, mm -hmm. the parent wants to protect protect that child at all costs from everything. Mm -hmm. So it's challenging unless, you know, like I said, if that parent is enlightened, then that's a different story. Right. But I think a parent's natural instinct is to protect their child. So it's new information, information that they hadn't heard before. Um, if they're seeking to understand those things that are kind of like, hmm, well, that's peculiar. Mm. Or, hmm. And you notice little things in your child, like a two-year-old kid sitting at a piano playing the piano and have never had piano lessons, like, what? Right. When they start to know, <laughs> and they start to notice that this kid can figure out these mathematical equations at four years old, and they're like, what? When they start to see these little things in their child that other kids their age aren't doing, then I would highly encourage parents to nurture and foster those natural instincts that children have because what happens is sometimes when parents notice certain things they want to kind of muffle it and cover it up those those layers they cover those things up and the child literally gets stifled and it's not until years later or sometimes even never that that child doesn't rediscover those things that they used to do and it's like me with psychology my mom telling me you know you're not going to make any money within that field go do you know study business do something else but inside of me, psychology was always calling me. And what have I been doing for the last 20 some odd years of my life, working with kids who are at risk in the field of psychology and absolutely loving what I do. So I think at some point, it's always going to call you. So even if parents don't recognize that and they don't nurture that, it's always inside of you. It's always going to be tapping you on the shoulder. It's always going to be nagging at you. And some people will say, all right, what is this? Let's go on the journey. Let's let's figure out with all this tapping and breadcrumbs and non-coincidences, all these things. That, what is this stuff? You know, and then you start to <clears throat> hear other people, <clears throat> excuse me, you start to hear other people say things you've never heard before. And that's kind of how it happened for me. I was hearing people saying things I had never heard before, but it spoke to me. So that's kind of, you know, you're kind of led back to it, even though you, it may get covered up. You're, you're led back to that place. Um, but I would encourage parents when they notice those, those little things, those special things about children to do their own research, mm. ask their own questions about what is this? What, how is it that my kid is two years old and they're able to play the piano? And I, you know, I watch little kids on social media all the time. I have a couple of little special nieces, IG nieces and nephews that I follow. Mm. And I mean, I'm thinking, I'm looking at these kids and I'm like, What? Here's a little two-year-old girl that I follow. Her name is Ermesby. They call her Poopy. <laughs> and this little girl is two years old. And she's on this scooter, like literally. You know how with a scooter, you got to just kind of pump it with your foot? Yeah. This kid hops on this scooter and she's pumping it with her foot. And she's down the street on this scooter. I'm thinking she's two. <laughs> so her parents, and that's a, good, that's a good question that you asked me that I think about this little girl. Her parents nurture and foster that in her so everything that she has a desire to do or want to do or has an interest in they nurture that they nurture that and there's another little mother her 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 name is his name is ba uh, baby ray ray anthony same thing i mean this kid he has more stamps in his passport than i do so they expose him to a lot of different things so i think that's the key also is to kind of expose your kid to different things to see what they like, to see what they're naturally drawn to, and then to just kind of foster those natural abilities that they have. So good. So good. Another question that I have that, how do we help the Black community? Because this is actually the hardest community for me sometimes to speak to. A lot yeah. of people don't understand. I mean, a lot of people are like, you're crazy. Yeah. I think, again, it goes back to people who are seeking something 
different than what they're accustomed to or what they grew up in. When people are seeking, when they're searching, they're going to they're going to be they're going to naturally attract what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. If the person is not open, and it could be any nationality, but specifically right. talking right. to African American, yes. yes. I think it's just exposing people to different things. I think it's I think it's our job to help enlighten people, even if, even if and it, it's our job to plant the seed. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because even if they don't have this aha moment in the moment that they're spending with you, maybe six months from now or a year from now, they're going to remember that Ashley told me this or Ashley said this. It's going to resonate. So our responsibility is to plant the seed. We're not responsible what they do with that seed. And that's how I always felt with, with the young people that I work with. My job is to spread the seeds all over the state of Georgia to every kid that I meet. I'm going to spread the seed. I may not ever see that kid bloom or, or, or blossom, but I know that I've done my part. We all have a role to play. So what I would say to that is whoever you encounter, African-American women, Af African-American men, children, whoever that particular audience is, our responsibility is to plant the seed. We're not responsible for what they do with the seed. But I guarantee you, it's going to resonate. I drive my, I drive my work colleagues insane. I'm always, and it's, it's like we have this thing on Thursday when we're all in the office together. We, I'm just giving knowledge. Every time I see people, I'm giving knowledge, giving information. A lot of things that we talk about now, we're talking about money and we're talking about investments and we're talking about you know, not just saving your money, but investing money. We're not talking about being rich. We're talking about being wealthy and being able to pass on that generational wealth, passing on that generational wealth knowledge, not just the what. Of course, people want to be wealthy for, for whatever reason. They want to be rich. I don't want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. I'm going to be wealthy. Wealthy in my spirit, wealthy in my mind, wealthy in every part of my being, in my health. And of course, in my bank accounts and my investments, you want that because I feel like when you have that level of wealth, you're able to do more and you're, you, can, you can provide access to people who don't have access. You can provide resources to people who don't have resources. You can provide opportunities to people who don't have opportunities. So in that space, like I said, you, you spread the seeds. That's what we do. We spread the seeds. And a lot of people... Don't, and I heard you say this on, on your, one of your last interviews, you were talking about the relationship with money. Like that's a, that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've been teaching my, you know, my agency is money mindset, understanding. It's not just about, oh, because people are saying, oh, I don't have enough money. Well, what are you doing with the money that you do have? Do you have a budget? First of all, that's the first question I ask people. Do you have a budget? Because mm -hmm. if you tell me you don't have any money to invest, do you have a budget? No, I don't have a budget. Well, if you don't have a budget, you don't know that you've got an extra hundred bucks that you can put that in a, invest, right? Yes, you know what I'm saying. So, and then we start breaking it down from there. So for me, whenever I talk to people, I always ask very strategic questions. That's going to make people think. You have to ask those thought-provoking questions to make people think. So even though, so we're asking the thought-provoking questions and we're planting those seeds at the same time. So doing those two things for me, I feel has been very helpful in at least helping people to think differently. Because if you're not thinking differently, you're not behaving differently. If, you, if, you're, if you're waking up every day and you're having the same thought over and over and over again, chances are you're not changing your actions because your actions follow your thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's the thought, then it's the behavior. Mm -hmm. So good. And since, well, as you're planting seeds, we know how this is. What is your favorite seed to plant? It's the thought. It's the mindset. It's, it's the mind rules everything. The mind is, I mean, oh my God, OMG. The mind is the, it's such, the mind, the mind is a vibe. The <laughs> mind is a flex. Like y'all just don't know. Y'all don't understand. The mind is seriously a vibe. It's the mood, it's the flex, it's, it's all of that. And if you can learn how to control your thoughts, 
And that's, those are books that I was reading in high school. Psycho-cybernetics. I was reading books like that in high school, like understanding how the mind work and understanding my thoughts because I wanted to understand why do I think this way? Why do I act this way? Why am I doing this? Why am I responding this way? And I was asking myself these questions early on. It wasn't until later on that I started, it started to unfold. The why started to unfold. You know, it was the what, and then it was the why. And then it became, okay, well, I don't like what I see. So how am I going to change this? How am I going to change this? Mm. And it's teaching people how to do that. To, to, but, but people have such the instant gratification thing. It's like, I want this thing to happen overnight. It took me 55 years to do this. Like, I, I'm going to give you all this knowledge. I'm going to give all of it to you. But don't just think you're going to take this whole 55 years and flip this thing overnight. It's not going to happen. It's not happening. <laughs> so, yeah. So people have to be patient with themselves. They have to be gentle with themselves. Because when you start to talk about transforming your life and, and teaching the how, what we really have to understand is the core, the essence of why we do what we do. And a lot of it is seated in trauma. A lot of it is based on, we're sitting on a lot of trauma, unhealed trauma, unhealed wounds that we've buried, we've, we're unaware of, but if somebody pokes it, we get triggered, we go off on people, we do all these different things we can't have healthy relationships because, you know, you're in a relationship with an emotionally immature person. They're in a relationship with someone who didn't resolve something when they were five years old or six years old. And people like to kind of dismiss, you know, childhood experiences. But, you know, there's something called ACEs. It's, it's uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences, which talks about the effects of what happens to you when you, when you get older. There are certain illnesses that manifest as it relates to those adverse childhood experiences. Mm. People don't understand that. And so they, they dismiss, oh, well, this happened to me as a kid. That doesn't have anything to do with, oh, yeah, it does. Think about this for, think about, I'm going to put it to relationships. We talk about relationships. Who was the first person you ever loved in your life? Your mom, your dad, mom your, dad your, care, your, family. your caregiver. Yep. Exactly. Yep. If you had a dysfunctional relationship with those people, what do you think your adult relationships are going to be? It's just a mirror image of what it was growing up. Yeah. So now you've got these two people trying to be in a relationship with each other. And it's like, to me, I feel like we're just little children in adult bodies walking, running around trying to get our little needs met. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get my knees met. You're trying to get your knees met. You, know? you don't understand my love language. You don't you know. even know what your love language is. Right. I can't communicate to you what I want because I don't know what I want. I don't know what I need. Because we don't spend any time figuring those things out. And I'm going to tell you one thing that really just like devastated me. That really broke my heart. I was 46 years old. And that was the moment that I realized that I had been emotionally immature all of my life. That was devastating to me. What, had, what was the relevation? <laughs> You're like, what the what? What was that? Like, can you just give us something? <laughs> I need to picture this. I was writing a book. Okay. And I was, the book just kind of, it's like, it's called Peeling Back the Layers of Your Life, 365 mm -hmm. Hidden Treasures. And basically what I did was I was telling like little short stories, 365 short stories of my life mm -hmm. and having like a little affirmation and then telling the short story. Beautiful. So I was writing the story. I can't remember what I was writing about. I think I probably was writing about relationships and love and different things like that. And as I'm sitting down and I'm writing and I'm thinking to myself, I just had this, this feeling in the pit of my stomach. I was like, Ooh, this hurts. This, there's, there's something here. And that's when it hit me. Like you have been emotionally immature your entire life. 
And I tell you, I had to stop writing. I for I need to say this real quick. It's 1111 on 1111. Stop, so man. Mad. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's 1111 on 1111. Look at us. <laughs> Listen, we're changing some stuff. I'm telling you, you that know? right now, Ashley. We're changing some stuff. We're moving some energy around here. <laughs> this is phenomenal. I'm going to send you the screenshot when we're done. But yeah, so as I was writing that, I was thinking to myself, I, had, I literally had to stop writing. I don't, remember, I don't remember for how long, but I, I literally just had to stop and sit in that moment and to understand how and why, how is this possible? Mm. How is it possible that I've gone this many years of my life and I'm just discovering that I'm emotionally immature? So then I started playing back some of the relationships I had been in and the different people, my different teachers, because people come to you to teach you things. And I'm looking at my, my previous teachers and I'm like, oh, God, wow, you, you were really acting that way. You were really doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember a good friend of mine, uh, my best friend, Jennifer, Jennifer Laughlin, when I first met her, she said to me, don't try to push me away. I'm going to be your friend no matter what. I know you're trying to push me away, but I'm, I'm going to be your friend. I'm thinking, wait a minute. First of all, I'm older than you. She was like, <laughs> she was like 21 and I was like 25 or 26. I'm like, Who are well, you? Little girl. Hey, Jennifer. Like, all right. I was like, Jennifer, girl. <laughs> but she, I mean, she called it right out. She called me out. She called me out, Ashley. She called me out. So I just started thinking about those. I mean, to this day, we're still friends. Um, it's amazing. I met her at work. She was one of my, my good work colleagues when I worked in corporate. And we just remained friends over the years. Aww. And she shout literally. Out to Jen. Hey, Jen. Yeah, shout out to Jen. She, <laughs> Jen called me out. I was like, all right, if you're going to be around, you're going to have to deal with some shit. <laughs> <laughs> and she literally helped me to, like, put the mirror to my face like now you Rhonda you know you should be acting like this wow and that's what it was it was yeah emotionally immature so then I had to like take a step back and just be like okay well I'm not going to be doing any kind of dating of any sort right now because I need to get some things together mm -hmm. you know people think that you know I, I feel like sometimes you you have to be in relationships to kind of figure out some things about yourself but when you, for me, I don't know about anybody else, but when you're in a space where you like discovered something like that, you don't need to, bring, you don't need to bring anybody else into that kind of stuff. You just, oh. it's not fair. But good for you that you, A, first of all, allowed the emotion to come to you. You know what I mean? You allowed it and you allowed it to reveal something and maybe what it revealed, you know, maybe it was a little tough at first, but just the fact that you were like, okay, well, let's <laughs> Let's go. Let's fix it then. Okay, yeah. No problem. Yeah. So it says a lot. You know what I mean? It's it's just it's amazing. Yeah. I'm so be proud better. of you. Thank you, Ashley. Ernie, Thank you. everything that you've been doing. Cute. What can we see next? Where does the tree sprout next? Like oh my gosh. what? My gosh! Like behind me, my my uh, vision boards. I mean, there's so many things on there. Look at I just. My primary purpose, my mission, my desire, my aspirations, my inspirations, my motivation is people. Like I want to see people better. So whatever that looks like, it looks like private retreats with, you know, an intimate group of people helping women to have these conversations that we're having because a lot of people aren't even having these conversations so having retreats, going into corporate spaces and talking to employees and enlightening people, opening people's minds to the possibility that, hey, your life can be better. It, it doesn't have to be what it is today. It can be different if you choose that, if you decide that's what you want to do. And just talking to people. You know, I want to just go around the world and inspire people to live their best life and to help them to create the life that they want to live. And however that manifests, I'm, I'm open to that and building a wellness brand, just wellness. So I feel like all of this is about being well, 
in your mind, in your body, in your spirit, and you're just everything, just being well and being happy. I'm so proud of you. This journey that you're on, who you are, embracing yourself, loving your, giving yourself the love and care that you deserve, that that is just there for you. And then, then the fact that that just makes you become so selfless and giving it to others. So Absolutely. you are someone that I personally look up to. And I know that anybody listening to this today can definitely appreciate it and just hear, just hear the good person in you. Thank you, Ashley. I think the same for you. I think you're awesome. You're so insightful to be a young person. Like I'm, I'm always so amazed that, you know, when I see a young person just, I mean, I'm just like, wow, you know? Girl, sometimes yeah. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I appreciate the compliment, but I promise you someday. <laughs> but to have the level of incitement yeah. and enlightenment that you do have, I mean, that's that's the that's the critical piece of the puzzle. Mm. It is. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know every single part of it, but you learn as you go. You know, you do better as you go. The more you learn, the better you do. So, better you do. yeah. But it, I just have the burning, like, I just know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I promise you, when I say I know, I just know that there, what I want is there, that there is more. Absolutely. And then for everybody else, like, but you too. Yeah. What do you mean you want to stay here? Come on. Absolutely. But the crazy part is, what we visualize and what we envision and what we feel is 10 times, I mean, a million times greater than what you're like, what we, when you finally see what it is, yeah. you're going to be like, no I know. way. I know. No I do, but, way. And I do that, but I find time every single day to do that. And every sure. time I do it, it feels and I, but I love to do it because I love to be by myself. You know how we are. We like mm -hmm. to be by ourselves in our room. And I'm thinking, and I just start laughing. Then I might cry, happy cry, but I'm crying. Happy crying. Like, oh, too good. It's so fun. Yeah. And I'm ready. That's, you know, that's another thing that I do. Every year I do yes. an, um, an affirmation or a mantra for the upcoming year. And I just wrote my, um, my mantra for 2022. And it's, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. So from 2000, the 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20, and now 21, I've written an affirmation for each one of those years. And this year, the affirmation is I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh. That's the mantra. Look out. That's it. I'm coming. I'm proud of you. Coming in hot. <laughs> coming in hot. She's coming in on that jet. That's what That's, ooh, doing. coming in jet. <laughs> Listen. I cannot wait. Do you know that? I cannot wait for you to call me and be like, girl. What do you mean call me? You're going to be on the jet next to me. Like, I'm be like, Ashley, can you believe this? Girl. <laughs> <laughs> can you believe what we get to do every day? <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been amazing. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Feel good? Oh, man, that was good. Good stuff. Yeah. That was really good stuff. I'm proud of you. Good. Yeah. Wow. That's the 100. That's number 100. I can't believe you I've know? talked to 99 people around the world. It's, it's so cool because you give everybody such a stage on your podcast. Now people get to really see. Yeah.